right, um, it's 11.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar today. My name is Kirsten Patton, and I'm the Working Group Manager at ATARC, and we are going to be kicking off our new Quantum Working Group with this webinar. Um, I'll briefly introduce our moderator, Maeva, and then Maeva, I'll let you take it over from there. Um, so our moderator today is Maeva Gonda. She is a Quantum Scholar for the Joint Quantum Institute. Maeva is also the chair of the Quantum Initiative Advisory Board and the AI chair for Ethics and Responsible AI. Uh, for IEEE, Maeva is the chair of the Blockchain Cybersecurity Team for Healthcare and Life Sciences, and she is also on the editorial board of IEEE's peer-reviewed blockchain technical briefs and a member of IEEE's Blockchain Standards Steering Committee for IEEE's Blockchain Initiative. <laughs> Um, as a cybersecurity risk management expert, Maeva leads the Cloud Security Alliance's team of 210 globally recruited blockchain technology experts. And Maeva's cybersecurity team includes the brightest minds from Facebook, Google, Amazon, IBM, JP Morgan Chase, and many more renowned institutions worldwide. So thank you, Maeva, for helping me put this all together, and I'll let you take it from here. Of course. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of our quantum group. As Kirsten said, my name is Maeva, and I am the chair of the Quantum Initiative Advisory Board. Essentially, our quantum group is a public-private partnership, which includes experts from various quantum disciplines, from physics, mathematics, computer science, and engineering. And our primary goals are to provide a platform that strengthens relationships between public and private enterprises, government agencies, institutes, and universities, academic institutions. And we also want to work together to strategize as a multidisciplinary group in order to achieve our common goals in the different areas of quantum science and technology. And our objective for today is, in a sense, to offer an opportunity for members of our greater quantum community and our audience members to get perspectives from practitioners with expertise across the quantum spectrum. And um, with that said, I'd like to introduce everyone to our esteemed panel of speakers for today's event. And I'll begin with Major Ken, Cor I'm sorry, Ken Corigliano, <laughs> Chief Intelligence for the US Air Force. And next, we'll, have, we'll also have Tony Utley, President of Quantum Solutions for Honeywell. Dr. John Martini, Google's former Chief Scientist for Quantum Hardware and Professor of Physics at UC Santa Barbara. We have Gabe, Gabe Chang, IBM Quantum Ambassador and Federal CTO Architect at IBM. We have Mr. Michael Gardner, Deputy Assistant Chief Information Officer for the USDA. We're also joined by Dr. Lili Chen. She's post-quantum cryptography, cryptography leader for the Computer Security Division at NIST. And Dr. Mark Heiligman, Program Manager at IARPA, which is part of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And of course, we also have our registered guests that are a key part of this panel. It's important that you participate. We want everyone to interact and ask questions you know, as they come up. But feel free to start asking questions now. You don't have to wait till the end of, uh, you know, till our speakers are done. With um, any questions before we, we begin, I'd like to, um, if not, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker who has become a great friend, Major Ken Corigliano. He is a superhuman and, um, before I introduce Ken formally, I just want to say thank you to Ken for being a great friend and a great leader. Essentially, several days ago, by chance, Ken happened to be the first person I spoke with after I had watched the video of George Floyd. And so he caught me in a state of shock and just a state of intense grief. And I'm very grateful because in that moment, Ken recognized an opportunity to be a leader and a friend to me. While I may not remember his exact words, you know, the exact words he used to pull me out of that state of shock, I'm super grateful that he listened and that he was just super kind to get me out of that space by the time our conversation was done. 
So Ken, I thank you. I'm extremely grateful for your kindness. You lead with your heart. And I'm always in inspired, greatly inspired every time I work with you, your discipline, your work ethic, your commitment to excellence are unmatched. With that said, I'll briefly go over Ken's accomplishments. He's been granted a patent in over 30 trademarks and has received numerous awards over the years, including Officer of the Year, U.S. Air Force Athlete of the Year, and his expertise includes peer-to-peer -peer conflict, AI, machine learning, quantum information science, strategic wargaming, and he is the inventor of the Corrigliano method. Ken's military assignments include Duke Field Flying Crew as Chief MC-130E, Andrews Air Force Base Intelligence Support to Air Force One and Special Air Missions, Cannon Air Force Base, New Mexico Tier One Remotely pilot, Piloted Aircraft Intelligence Support to Targeted Operations, U.S. CENTCOM Battle Space Visualization Chief and Operations Officer for Counter ISIS Fusion Center, Barksdale Air Force Base, Air Force Base as Chief of MAGECOM Intelligence, 608 AOC Chief of Analysis, Correlation and Fusion, and as NRO Chief of Intelligence Discovery Cell and Chief of U.S. Air Force Outreach Home Team. And um, he's very involved in his community. He's, he also participates in multiple working groups. So in addition to his primary responsibilities, Ken has participated in the U.S. Air Force Quantum Working Group, the U.S. Air Force AI Strategy Working Group, and the President's AI's AI R&D Working Group. Ken has been recruited to participate in the Joint Chiefs of Staff's Common Operating and Intelligence Picture Working Group, based realignment and closure extensive analysis delivered to, the, to our U.S. Congress, Google Earth Development Team, view shed virtual world building for presidential travel pr protection, and at scale 3D model building for SOF strike teams. Ken is also the founder of the intelligence community's most heavily used site, Go IC, the ecosystem of systems. And he also volunteers with numerous organizations, including mentoring at, at risk children, volunteering with human trafficking at human trafficking shelters, the Special Olympics, and he continues to touch the lives of hundreds of people in need through pro bono counseling and life coaching sessions. Ken, thank you for your service. Please go ahead with your keynote. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor and a, and a pleasure, and I appreciate you all taking time out of your busy days um, to join us here and to uh, entertain my, uh, my first keynote. So uh, I appreciate that. As, uh, as mentioned, I'm a major in the Air Force. Um, I just happen to have a deep love and feeling of gratitude to this nation, uh, as I'm sure is shared with many of us on the call. Um, if we weren't here, we want to have these deep relationships. And uh, as she mentioned, uh, relationships are the most important thing. Technology is really cool, but at the end, at the end of the day, it's the lives that we change and, and the personalities that we touch that make it all worth it. I think the greatness of our nation has hinged upon an unmatched symbiosis of public-private partnerships, really many uh, more than anywhere in the world, uh, but it's through the vision and entrepreneurial drive of our leaders that we draw energy to, fall, to follow a call to greatness. Uh, there is tremendous power unleashed when a strong relationship forms among government and private leadership. The American people trust these relationships, uh, especially during uncertain and challenging times. There is no doubt quantum science holds an uncertain future, but when observed hints of an unprecedented opportunity, which sounds a lot like our wave duality, uh, wave particle duality problem to me. Uh, as science looks deeper into quantum phenomenon and learns more, we seem to know less. Certainty eludes us. Quantum phenomenon mirrors the challenges our policymakers have in the normal course of their duties. Well, many times in science, we want to know why, but policy has to focus on how. We're not really sure the whys behind electricity, 
why our bodies rest and digest gravity or, or much about natural phenomena. But we are really good about finding out how and capitalizing on it. America has many proud moments in history when legislation and executive orders resulted in capital opportunities that gave tremendous returns of investment. These big achievements came from effective policy and also a presence of a challenge to our leadership in that domain. Quantum science isn't new, but it is very complex and few people in the early days could understand it. We lacked a, a peer competitor also to motivate us to do though. Folks, that has changed. Historically, our policymakers have relied on nonprofits and special advisory groups to provide advice and early warning of competition. The time again is now and it is our duty to ensure we navigate the right path. Therefore, it is my pleasure to be part of ATARC's Quantum Initiative Advisory Group and it's the right time for the right reason. Congress and the President have stepped in to finance the advancement of quantum sciences now it's our job to advise them and provide our thoughts on policy, vision, and means as they again write history. So let's talk about great policy. In 1825, America watched the first commercial product arrive by combustion engine on a railroad, but that was in England. Then faced with the threat of the Confederacy and observing the direct impacts of railroads, America passed the Pacific Railway Act in 1862. The Congress had a vision that the U.S. shall be connected from the West Coast to the East Coast, gave over 174 million acres of land grants, wrote funding agreements, and so 18,000 workers from all over the world labored for seven years. Even despite being in the middle of an existential war, this set in motion the world's greatest transportation, logistics, and communication systems, for the next hundred years, our country exploded with industry, technology, and energy. Realizing we were behind and the threat of the South had a lot to do with answering that call to greatness. Nonetheless, Congress's vision, means, and resources enabled America to take on the impossible as the world watched us become the world leader. We are now watching the first commercial products arriving by quantum technology. So let's talk about great vision. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy won, made one of the most famous speeches of human history. We choose to go to the moon. It rallied the entire nation to a cause and a vision that only a few of us knew had, we had no, no physics to justify. The US was losing the space race, but realized an entire industry would sprout up around this vision. Stepping up to the threat of the Soviet Union had everything to do with this accomplishment. America had no idea what it would take to land a human on the moon, but what it needed was a clear vision of the future and the means to materialize it. Strangely similar to the Railway Act, a hundred years earlier, Kennedy's vision also manifested after seven years and thousands of people's hard work in a story that all American school children are taught. Just think of that. In a hundred years, we went from navigating wagons on the Oregon Trail to navigating our rocket to the moon. With policy and vision, we made this land of great opportunity. Let's talk about the next great opportunity. In 1925, exactly 100 years after we watched commerce by rail, the world was introduced to a science that would go against accepted laws of physics. With Born and Jordan's paper, on quantum mechanics, published and birthed the discipline of quantum mechanics. Stranger than people can imagine, quantum science wasn't received well enough to be acted upon. Then while computers and the internet became ubiquitous, our policy attempted to catch up. In an act on the level of the transatlantic railway or a speech like Kennedy's, never stood a chance. Until now, now we have a peer competitor who has openly challenged our way of life and has clearly articulated a strategy for replacing us as the world leader. This competitor is unlike any other we've encountered. They've made the necessary legislation to clear the way for industrialization, as well as made visionary statements to inspire their billion plus population. And they seem to have no spending limits. Their investment in quantum sciences exceed ours 
by an order of magnitude. In their mind, there is no question. Quantum sciences will expand the understanding of physics, the natural world, and perhaps ourselves. But how do we proceed? Well, let's talk about means. My friends and colleagues, the time for, now, time for action is now. This calls for the ultimate in incentivizing the private sector in a visionary call to action from our policymakers and American leadership, because action is what America does best. This working group will step in to spark a call to action through a visionary picture of the future that our policymakers can adopt. I believe we are embarking on the greatest discoveries in human history. With this, I present my own personal views in the hope that it will spur your own thoughts and discussions that perhaps will write the history of America as our predecessors had. First division, I envision the United States as the leader in quantum algorithm development. The world's brightest will come to study here to fulfill this vision along the brightest Americans. With this leadership, we will develop unbreakable and instantaneous communications, have timing systems that endure for thousands of years on any celestial bodies, and we will pursue, pursue the detection and understanding of dark matter and perhaps the discovery of a grand unifying theory, all happening on American soil. Our nation's secrets are pivotal to the peace, harmony, health, and economy of the entire globe. We first need communication structures for our decision makers to exercise dime. The diplomatic information, military and economic instruments of power must be free from influence, tampering, manipulation or eavesdropping. We need to have perpetual knowledge of all four known dimensions. Accurately and precise, high fidelity, timekeeping will revolutionize every, every aspect of society. We must push further, deeper, and know more about quantum phenomenon and subsequently our universe. We must fund the most audacious, auspicious, and experimental efforts that seek to disrupt our assumptions of the laws of nature. And I dare to say we need to aggressively encourage a competition for the grand unifying theory. Just as we sought to put human feet on the moon, which has led to the first commercial astronauts, commercial satellites that can determine the letters of license plates and soon what eye color you'll have. Very little moves, emits, or changes on Earth without a man-made object in space having evidence of it. However, a vast majority of the universe's existence has been elusive. Perhaps the only technology of furthering the detection of dark matter and dark energy is quantum. But we need the policy and the means for this opportunity. I propose for the purposes of our policymakers, we divide this effort into three steps. The first step is the pursuit of algorithms. Dedicating specific dollars for quantum algorithm development will spur multiple things. Computers, cryptography, and communications cannot proceed without algorithms. If we focus on a secure supply chain and on the wetware and software to, to drive it, an ecosystem will develop incumbents in public schools, universities, engineering academies, research centers, commercial and industrial companies, and the public sector relationships. Optimize and build the algorithms through that ecosystem, the hardware will follow. As we explore the behavior of quantum algorithms, we will discover more about quantum phenomenon and push the limits of modeling the incredible observations of the natural world and mastering the art of probabilistic computation. The limits of classical computers limit our understanding of nature's secrets. I argue the greatest inventions were modeled from nature. Stealth technology, helicopters, submarines, heavier than air flight, sonic boom suppression, Velcro, hydrophobics, air conditioning, con condensers, prosthetic limbs, injection meters, waterproofing, basically everything we rely on to survive in our modern society and everything you're relying on to watch me deliver this keynote was already here. Nature offers us the greatest solutions. Then the second step is to fund a forever clock that can operate without drastic temperature regulation and one that can operate in space and on any object in the solar system. The last step is to incentivize totally passive detection, uh, de uh, passive detection at distances using photons. This will allow the utility of time and internal navigation for multiple purposes. This could assist us in detecting previously undetected phenomena such as dark matter and dark energy or other dimensions that are of now only in the dreams or unprovable mathematical models on chalkboards of the most audacious physicists. I think we, 
we will discover incredible insights as to our own existence, the secrets of the universe, new ways of energy creation, new materials, medical breakthroughs, and personally most exciting to me and personally touching to me is the an artificial intelligence to help the blind see, the deaf hear, the elderly to regain their independence in modeling the phenomena of nature like natural disasters and life forms. And just maybe we'll finally figure out how that bee stays airborne. And I think most of us would just settle for actually getting a weather report that we can use. All joking aside, if this vision sounds silly or too audacious, tell me if this sounds familiar. We have had our failures, but so have others, even if they do not admit them. To be sure, we are behind, and we will be behind for some time, but we do not intend to stay behind. And in this decade, we shall make up and move ahead. The growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, for the home, as well as the school. Colleagues, we have been here before. That was Kennedy's speech from 1962. And although we may express differences in the realm of the probable, I think we can inspire a vision of the future so audacious it moves us again. When we fail, and we will, and still have to pay the bill, reflect back on the closing part of Kennedy's speech. Remember, we choose to pursue quantum achievements not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because this challenge is one that we are willing to accept and one we intend to win. With that, let's get to work. And again, it's been an honor to speak here today. Ma Maeva, you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. I'd like to go ahead and transition to our speakers. So um, I'd like to start with, I guess, Tony, can you introduce yourself, please? Be happy to. Yes, my name is Tony Utley. I am the president of Honeywell Quantum Solutions. Uh, I could say former engineer, but, uh, but once an engineer, always an engineer. Uh, spent a decade at NASA at the Johnson Space Center, um, almost a decade in, in consulting with the Boston Consulting Group, and then have been leading this effort within Honeywell for quite a long time, and most of that under the radar for a long time, but uh, to get to a point where we could show people what we have done versus just talk about what we might be able to do. And uh, we're right now starting to release our first series of quantum computers. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. John Martinez, would you like to go next? Uh, hello, my name is uh, John Martinez, and I've been working on qubits since actually the mid 1980s, even before the word was coined, and uh, been working on them with superconducting qubits and building up the technology along with many other people around the world. Um, probably I'm best known for the uh, being the spokesperson leader of the quantum supremacy experiment, which we uh, published in the fall of last year, where we show the, the potential power of a quantum computer. Uh, doing that on a kind of a crafted problem, but nevertheless showing the power of a quantum computer. Uh, I'm interested in, in building a quantum computer, making a useful quantum computer, and uh, I, I left Google recently and I'm trying to set up some uh, private uh, business ventures uh, to help, uh, help build that and make it available to people. Thank you so much. Dr. Lili Chen, would you like to go next, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lili Chen. I'm the group lead in the cryptographic technology group in NIST under the computer security division. So I'm a mathematician. Our group uh, publish crypto standards for encryption, for authentication, and our critters have been implemented in almost every digital device, in the internet routers, and everywhere in the infrastructure. So you might have a question about why I'm here. 
And because I'm a mathematician and I'm not working on the quantum computers, well, um, because a lot of the crypto system today, when you log in your bank account, it use public key cryptography, which will risk for the quantum attacks once quantum computers become available. So we are working on a crypto system which can resist to uh, quantum attacks. So that's what we are doing and why I'm here. Thank you. Maeva, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Lily. Michael, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Michael Gardner. Um, I am the deputy CIO for the USDA's Rural Development uh, Agency. And so um, I guess probably the best way to kind of describe why I'm here is um, I would, I guess I'm a fairly decent representative of those folks who ultimately, especially in government, have to implement this stuff one day. Um, you know, down at the, uh, you know, down to the, at the tactical level, trying to, you know, resolve many of the issues that Lily kind of, you know, described. Um, you know, I've spent the last 30 years, again, down at the tactical level, you know, implementing um, um, you know, integration solutions to have, you know, systems, you know, com uh, conveniently talk to each other, um, having, you know, systems securely, you know, um, exchange information. Um, and so to the extent that a, uh, a quantum computing infrastructure has the, um, has the ability to essentially tear asunder the, um, you know, the underlying public key infrastructure, that makes all of this stuff work at a tactical level. I'm very interested in in uh, in ways in which we can do things now um, to you know practically um, um, move toward a, a you know a system that is less susceptible to those kinds of attacks. So, thank you so much, Michael. Gabe. Yes. Like hi. Thank you. Sure. Uh, as Maeva mentioned, I'm from IBM. Uh, we're roughly a 350 to 400,000 employee company, and uh, I'm one of the lucky few of us that uh, there's less than, let's say, 200 of us that actually have the role of quantum ambassador. So I'm currently focusing on, on big data, AI, analytic solutions for our uh, DoD and intelligence agencies, um, looking to drive novel insights for our hardest challenges, um, supply and technical solutions for federal government and community partner agencies. Um, but I, cert I, uh, I currently support a number of quantum strategy initiatives uh, with industry government partnership organizations and acting in my uh, federal CTO architect role as part of like the technical conscience for IBM. So uh, if I could just take a quick moment to share with you like the perspective of the quantum computing era that we have, you know, it's clear that the world today is being challenged with much more complex problems than we ever have seen in the past. Um, you know, COVID-19 is one of these powerful examples of the challenges that we're confronted with. And we're trying to understand how uh, these sort of challenges and the deep functioning of, of nature and its implications uh, that it has for all of us in society today. Um, if I could uh, uh, quote uh, Dr. Richard Feynman, um, back in 1981, IBM and MIT hosted a physics of computation conference. And uh, what, what he said there was, um, uh, I'm not happy with all of the analyses that go with just the classical theory because nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And so, you know, with respect to COVID and, and its sort of natural properties, it's roughly 100 nanometers inside. And we're struggling with ways to deactivate the function of that virus. So we know that computation can actually help us. 
if we look at the inner structure, there's these spiking proteins and these proteins can be modeled and understood in ways, therefore we can actually um, exploit, explore different kinds of compounds that could actually deactivate how they function. Um, not only do we need this high computational comp capability, but we can use these capabilities you know, across our organizations, um, partnership with federal government and institutions across the technical sector like our panelists are here today. Um, also with academia, we're forming these different partnerships and consortia for things like the COVID uh, types of solutions and projects. And uh, we are part of a consortia uh, that is providing, you know, over 400 teraflops of compute power, over 100,000 nodes. Um, we're hoping to understand the evolution of the virus, uh, accelerate the pace at which we can provide um, antivirals and, and ultimately vaccines. So when we have these exponential type problems, um, you know, we have enormous computational demands. And so we're tackling those uh, demands now with a, the current computing paradigm, which is really the world of bits. But if we want to look at a new paradigm uh, for computation, we have this emerging uh, world of qubits. And uh, at IBM, we have the the world's largest fleet right now of, of quantum machines all available in the cloud. We're using those in conjunction with government agencies and uh, such as the national labs, uh, AFRL, lots of industry partners like ExxonMobil and Daimler. And uh, we're hoping to uh, explore these different sector verticals in chemistry, finance, nature, life sciences. Um, and what we're looking to do with uh, the different areas within quantum. Uh, typically, you see optimization kinds of problems, AI, ML for decision support, uh, adaptive customer interaction, you know, the list goes on and on. But uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of this new ATARC working group, and, and hopefully uh, we can have you all join us and develop these new ideas and frameworks for, for quantum computing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabe. Sure. Mark, would you like to go next, please? Mark, can you hear us? While we sort that out, uh, Go ahead and um, start with questions that we've received so far. So the first question I have here is, which quantum areas are likely to be commercial first? Um, I guess let's start with, uh, John, would you like to take a guess? Or maybe not a guess? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I to um, well, you know, uh, people are already uh, using quantum mechanics in many uh, industrial process. You want to design a better transistor, you need to know about quantum mechanics. So uh, uh, it, it's already happening. We're just opening up the field even more. And I'm going to say in the past, people have in really uh, studying and, and using quantum mechanics to understand materials from you know, transistors to chemistry to uh, you know, a kind of things like that. And what's opened up in the last 20 years that theoretically, and I think beginning to do now, is the idea of using quantum mechanics to, for information processing. And uh, that's, uh, coming along, people are working on it. Uh, uh, again, some areas that are more closer to uh, atoms, for example, uh, atomic clocks, which people have been talking about prior, there's a lot of work and, and these are fielded right now and things are going to be better and quantum information ideas will make clocks better. And in some sense, that's going to be the natural uh, first use case because it's kind of already happened. There's a market for now. But I think as we see what happened with uh, business and technology when people had 
classical computer uh, information systems. Uh, once that happens in quantum, uh, it might really change the way we do things. And that, that has some, uh, some time to go. Classical systems are really go good. And we're going to, you know, it'll take a few more years to get there. There are demonstrations right now and, and user facilities. It's not uh, more powerful than classical computing for useful applications, but people are working at it. And, you know, any day now we could hear of a, a new paper that's coming out where they've done something useful and important, and that would change everything. So it's an exciting time in that respect. Right. Thank you so much. Gabe, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, so I, th I think we see like maybe three or four different areas um, uh, to answer the question that, that are probably uh, more near term than uh, further down the roadmap. Um, machine learning is, is one big uh, area um, around sampling, um, choosing your next uh, shopping purchase, uh, being able to do classification, decision support, those kinds of things. Um, another area would be like simulation, as, as John mentioned, around chemistry. Um, we're doing a lot with material science, um, with Daimler, things like uh, uh, making electric batteries better for your automobile. Um, and then the third area is probably around optimization kinds of things. So the travel and transportation uh, industry right now is, is uh, you know, currently suffering, but uh, Anything that has to do with uh, these very tough NP type problems, traveling salesmen and so on to, to manage your logistics, to shorten the supply chain, um, to uh, optimize your, your network infrastructure, um, air traffic control, uh, work schedules, other financial services, all of those things are, are uh, I think, um, uh, ripe areas for us to explore in the near future. Thank you so much. Tony, would you like to tell us what you're launching this year? <laughs> I'm excited to, to do that. Um, but I, actually, I might respond back to, to Mark made a comment in the, in the chat room, which is, it's an interesting way to think about quantum computing space. And the way I have talked about it is, is we're in, there's three eras of quantum computing. There's an emergent era, and that's where we are today. So that is quantum computers did not exist. Now they exist. And that is a, that's a huge transformational leap. That is now you can start actually exploring true quantum algorithms on top of it. You can start to tune things. You can start to find out which algorithms work better than others in certain situations and will guide development certainly over the next five to 10 years. There's a third era and that third era is this classically impossible. It's the one that everybody gets most excited about. It's the one that says, wow, you can use quantum computers to crack any encryption out there. Uh, that is still potentially a decade or more away. And, and then there's this middle part, and I've talked about it as classically impractical, and others have talked about it as something like a quantum advantage. But it is, it is an era where you get utility from using quantum computing because you're using it as a tool. It is a tool, one of many, just like classical computing is a tool. You can start to think about parsing out problem sets and say, this part of the problem will be most efficiently done using these quantum resources, just like you do that for a, a GPU. And so thinking about a QPU that is interspersed with classical resources in a time where you can say, well, technically, we could have done that computation using classical resources, but we just don't because it would have taken us three months to get the answer. Nobody is willing to wait three months given what we're trying to go accomplish with it. But are you willing to wait half a day to get that answer or a day to get that answer? The answer may absolutely be yes. And so you start to have this bridge that says, okay, you, you're emergent, you can do these resources, you can do these algorithms, you start to expand the capabilities of these systems and then find these areas where you really do have an advantage. You have this, this, this break into classically impractical as an era. And, and that is critical.
that is critical for where everybody is, both in terms of developing the hardware behind quantum computing, but also the algorithms that sit on top, because that will give you the guide. Without that guide, you have to then jump maybe decades out and say, what does that imagined thing look like versus how do we continue to evolve the tool set that exists today? So we're very excited to be, uh, to be releasing our offerings. We've been working with a number of partners already. And, uh, and while I won't use this particular venue to, to uh, share some specifically spectacular news, I will say last week was a very, very good week. So. Oh gosh, what a teaser. Something, something more. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. And um, Dr. Chen, do you have, would you like to contribute to this question or do you wanna move on to the next question? Uh, could we move the next question, please? Of course, thank you. So I have a question regarding um, what do you believe the impact will, what is the quantum impact on cybersecurity? How can we prepare for it? Okay, so I guess I can take that first. And uh, so, um, we today we uh, can live in a kind of digital world, right? So we um, have the pervasive networking uh, kind of connection, and we everybody have the digital device for many things. So the encryption authentication, this is the base. These are basic crypto functions are implemented in everywhere, right? It's a cornerstone of the today's cybersecurity. And uh, so uh, public key cryptography invented in 1976 has been used uh, to establish keys. For example, if you log in your bank account, you use TLS connection. That connection is to establish through a public key cryptography. And you also use digital signature to authenticate the bank and the, the bank will authenticate you, your device. So uh, that is why most of these uh, public key cryptography are based on uh, the, some hard problem, like the factorization is an example, like that, that is give you an integer and then you find the prime factors. So this has been believed to be a hard problem for classical computers. However, with the quantum computers, it's not a hard problem anymore, right? The factorization become easy. That means the public key cryptography system based on the factorization will not be secure anymore. So um, what we can do with that, and our team has been looking for uh, the quantum resistant cryptography. That means if factorization is uh, not hard for the quantum computers, what is hard for the quantum computers? So we do find something and with the research community and in the past uh, about the two decade, decade, like the short is the vector problem in the lattice is hard. So can we build the cryptography based on those? The answer is yes. Let me ignore all the details, just tell you yes. And we are working on that. In the past three years, and the NIST has been developing the post-quantum cryptography standards. So we received 82 submissions all over the world and uh, from 26 countries and the six continents. We are still working on that. Hopefully we can be ahead of the curve and to have some standards which are quantum resistant to cryptography. So if you want to know the details, you can Google us, just very easy to Google, N-I-S-T space uh, PQC. Then you will find what we are doing and our progress. And we really like to have people to join us 
to for this next generation of the public key cryptography standards, which to be secure, even with quantum computers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to add to that, please? I truly would. <laughs> so, no, no problem. Uh, and, and, and thank you. And thank you, Lily, and your, uh, your working groups at NIST for all the work you're doing uh, with that. As a, you know, a, again, as the, uh, as, the, as the representative here who, you know, has to practically make all this work, um, I will say that, um, you know, in my organization, I wear many hats. Uh, one of them as deputy CIO, which essentially means that I'm the chief operating officer for a, you know, 300 person um, IT organization. Okay. Um, and as chief information security officer, um, I ultimately am responsible for, you know, the, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all the data that flows through the, uh, uh, the agency. Having said that, I'll parse a little bit of what uh, 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 what Lily said a few seconds ago, and kind of um, kind of break that down in in sort of more on the ground terms. So you know, Lily is absolutely right in that um, you know quantum computing you know does stand to sort of tear asunder the public key infrastructure. We rely at a tactical level. We rely on that public key infrastructure to secure, for lack of better words, data that is in transit and data that is at rest um, in, very many, in very many cases. Um, and that is pervasive across both government and industry. Now, here's kind of the problem. The problem is that we know at some point that this public key infrastructure is going to fail. The key is the words at some point. So, there's a threat. I'll, I'll kind of break this in down in, 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 in terms. There is a threat called quantum computing, but a threat is only as good as the ability of one to exploit it. And so how do you exploit that in order to tear asunder the public key infrastructure? Well, uh, at the moment, you have to have the, the, the thing that only right now pretty much nation states have, money and time. Because right now, you don't have um, enough quantum computing infrastructure in order to be able to you know, tear down the public key infrastructure. You need significant computing resources, quantum computing resources to do it. So again, that's a function of money and it's a function of time, right? At some point, someone, if they're not already working on it, and I'm sure they are, um, are devoting the, uh, the resources necessary in order to you know, break public key algorithms. Um, that, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm positive is happening. It's gonna take a minute, why? Because this technology at the moment is expensive. The expertise in order to you know, uh, use the technology are scarce relative to classical computing models where the technologies are cheap relatively, and the expertise is plentiful, okay? So I say, I say all that to say this, we got a few years. That's the problem. The problem is we got a few years, probably not many, and it took a long time to build this public key infrastructure. So we need to start working now to build a new infrastructure. That's kind of the point. And so that is, you know, and so to the extent that you know, nation state actors who have both money and time to the extent that organized crime who has both money and time, you know, can devote to, you know, to put to, uh, to you know, to, to, to these kinds of quantum resources, um, these, you know, their ability to, their ability to crack our, in, our, our infrastructure will only increase. It's a race right now. I'll leave, my, I'll, I'll leave my comments right there. Hi, I'm John Martinez. I wanted to uh, fill in a little bit there. That was a very good uh, kind of summary, just where we are in hardware. So to break um, RSA at some level, I'll, I'll try to simplify this. You need about, uh, right now, the best algorithms, you need roughly 50 million, maybe 100 million qubits. 
you know, in terms of your laptop or whatever computer you want, that's not, not so many. But compared we are right now, that's a huge jump where we are now. So right now, we're at 10 to 50 physical qubits, and we need you know, maybe a million times that. So uh, you know, obviously that will take, take some time. In addition to that, we have to make our qubits better so that they don't lose their information so readily. And I'm, that has to be improved by maybe a factor of 10 or so. And it turns out that quantum mechanics says that improving both of those things at the same time is hard because kind of one pushes on the other when you try to design systems. So uh, it, we, we have some time, as you said, it's going to take a while, but given what we've seen with Moore's law and classical computing, well, you know, maybe uh, a factor of a million or, or more is uh, not something that's going to take forever long. It could, it could be that. So uh, that's why you know, people are working on it very hard. And I think that's why it's very important uh, at NIST, uh, in, in Lily's discussion, people are working on the next generation crypto systems because we have time but we have to be working on it really hard right now. And all these efforts should be uh, supported and understood and you know, getting, to work, getting to work as soon as possible because it's not gonna be clear when you know, maybe some of these computers might be available. It, 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 it'll take some time, but you know, exactly how much time we won't know. Okay, thank you so much. Before we move on to the next question, any last minute comments, please? Um, yeah, if, if, if I could just add something, um, sure. you know, as, as, uh, as stated, uh, just now by, you know, Michael and, and major Corgliano, there, there's a lot of, uh, scariness, I, I'd say, you know, involved with, um, different nation state actors being able to do, you know, what I call, um, scrape now and read later. And, uh, you know, being able to uh, take a lot of encrypted information and then uh, some point down the, the road, uh, actually being able to uh, examine the content semantically, uh, uh, discombobulate it and put it in pieces and parts and then just, you know, ascribe some sort of value to it is, is kind of a, a concern for all of our um, DOD and Intel agencies. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing in, in industry really are, are also uh, dedicated towards providing something that's called a, a quantum risk assessment. And if you wanted to um, do that, you could kind of create different milestones towards a, a quantum safe type of journey. Um, and um, right now, everyone is probably along, let's say, you know, one or two out of those, let's say four or five milestones. The first milestone I would say is uh, er everyone has already um, discovered and classified their data. So um, you classify the value of your data, you identify what your crown jewels might be, um, you identify the locations of where your data actually resides, um, then you take an inventory sort of as, as your next milestone. So um, you you want to find out how your data is encrypted, um, create a, uh, that inventory of the cryptographic information. If, if you don't know what you have, you could probably ask Lily. I know that she she has, you know, all of the different certificates, the encryption protocols, the different algorithms, the key lengths, and so on. But then you you want to get towards a futuristic standpoint down the roadmap where. You're, you're having some semblance of crypto agility. Um, you, you define and implement those processes. Um, you update uh, the life cycle to account for new crypto standards, those kinds of things. And then finally, you know, the holy grail really is that quantum safe uh, a milestone at the end of the roadmap where um, you're able to implement these quantum safe crypto algorithms. Um, you're able to understand the performance and impact of, of the quantum safe cryptography on your enterprise or uh, on your business in the case of industry. So it's kind of a, a maturity model um, for this, this uh, quantum safe roadmap. And uh, um, you know, there, there are a lot of companies out there who are doing these kinds of risk assessments. And, and I think that uh, you know, 
we could we could certainly explore that further in, in, a, in a working group. Thank you. Sure. Um, sorry, uh, one comment to that. Um, that's an, an interesting concept of crypto agility. Uh, again, I will I, I will say this in uh, the way systems take advantage of the public key infrastructure. Crypto uh, crypto agility, as you've defined it, is going to be both hard and costly. I'm gonna say one more time, costly. And so the, uh, um, to the extent that one can justify uh, that cost, you know, in terms of, you know, um, in terms of, you know, IT lifecycle costs, all that has to be factored in because, you know, I'm, it, it, it's going to be very difficult for somebody like me to go to, um, you know, the people that I report to and say, oh, I need to, you know, essentially uh, uh, rip out my whole uh, crypto infrastructure and replace it with a new one. Um, first off, they're not going to understand what the hell I'm talking about. Second, um, they're, uh, when I give them the bill, they're going to look at me like I'm nuts. Third, um, um, they, when I tell them how long it's going to take, they're going to be like, are you crazy? <laughs> so I want you to understand what, what, what crypto agility means at a practical level, right? right? You know, we built these systems to securely communicate based on the premise uh, that an infrastructure would be stable. Yes, and, and that, that infrastructure, yeah. as, as the costs come down, um, you know, I, I can pretty much guess at, at what Tony was talking about as his remarkable achievement uh, recently, but uh, as the costs come down for hardware, uh, I'm pretty sure that the improvements that, you know, we're seeing right now in the algorithmic, quantum algorithmic development as well as the access to quantum machines like over the cloud, um, you know, ecosystem, uh, you know, our, our software development platform is actually open sourced. So you can access that. Um, and then other government agencies such as um, the National Labs and AFRL and some of the other ones that we do work with, um, we know that um, there can be some partnerships that exist between um, yourselves and those other agencies where uh, the cost is shared across the board uh, for the different um, groups that are interested in exploring the, the tough problems. So I do see that, um, you know, on the flip side, uh, we, we are a for-profit company, so that kind of helps us in the back, in the back <laughs> end. However, um, it's, it's nice to it's nice to try to share and bring up the enablement for everybody's awareness in quantum, their education, and then hopefully with that sort of uh, proliferation of knowledge, we're, we're able to, uh, to also lower the costs that way. I, I agree. Well, thank you so much. Any last minute comments now? Thank you. Ken, if you're on, there's a question there from the, from the audience for you. Sure, um, let me check it out. Okay, so the, uh, the question is, um, AI and quantum are two big areas recently emphasized in research funding priority in government. What do you say the Air Force or DOD at large are hoping to leverage quantum and AI and overlap with quantum now and in the future? So. Uh, that is definitely a, a sensitive topic, um, of course. Um, a lot of these discussions are happening behind closed doors. Um, being a good steward of the taxpayer's money uh, requires us to spend responsibly, and usually that means proven technology that can deliver results. Also, procurement officers want to have knowledge and confidence uh, of what is being spent on. With quantum technology, those two variables rarely meet. Um, but there is a sense of urgency with the help of the Congress and, and POTUS. Quantum science, as, as Gabe spoke about, has a lot of promise in the realm of timing and navigation, which is normally PNT, precision, precision navigation and timing. And what we want is UPNT, which is ultra precision navigation and timing. So that could have serious decisive advantages of situational awareness, because um, ultimately we want to be in the business of peace 
uh, military systems deployments, long range operations, submerged um, ops and operations in space, as well as detecting threats and holding threats at what we call at risk. Uh, also, of course, I don't think uh, quantum encryption really needs much of a mention because that is probably the top discussion point at all quantum working groups as, as uh, Michael also just mentioned. So um, I think with AI, we're crawling, honestly, we're trying to get to our feet, uh, mainly kind of with uh, computer vision and trying to just optimize logistics chains and, and you know, as also, as Gabe said, the um, scheduling and stuff, stuff like that. So we're just, we're just getting to um, the, the very early stages here. So um, I hope that answers your question there. Yes, we're at time. I apologize. We do have two more questions that weren't answered. Do you guys want to give it a go or wrap up? It's up to you. I'm afraid I have a hard stop that I'm going to have to. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining. I think the second question probably already answered. Uh, so two more came in towards the bottom. Do you see, uh, do you see 1213 and 1213, let me see. Yeah, as quantum tech develops, do you see that question? About strategic so, controls? So I think the second question already answered through the discussion. Yeah, yeah. Did anyone else want to touch on any of the last two questions? 5G, next G. If not, we're at time, so we can call it a day. Hi, Mava. I'm just going to chime in real quick. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you to our moderator and our panelists and everybody who's um, tuned in for this webinar. It's been recorded, so we're gonna post it on our, on our ATARC website and you can share it out to your network. Um, if you are an audience member of this webinar right now, I highly encourage you to reach out to get involved in this quantum working group that ATARC uh, has now launched. We'll be meeting bi-weekly and we'd love to have government and industry and academia be a part of it moving forward. So thank you guys. Um, if you have any questions, want to reach out to me, I'm going to put my email um, in the chat right now, but we look forward to continuing these uh, wonderful conversations. So thank you guys. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank have you. a good day. Thank you.